It is a pleasure indeed to be here, and I'm delighted for the opportunity to speak to you, to tell you my story. And the story begins in a faraway place. When I was growing up in Athens, Greece, and one day while I was on my way to school, I was about 12 years old, a biplane of the Greek Air Force began to do acrobatics. I, I was alone. I had been late to really join my friends who usually come by my house to pick me up. And I stood right there watching that biplane doing acrobatics. I was not fascinated, but totally captivated. And when the exhibition was over and the airplane flew away, I said to myself, that's it. When I grow up, I'm going to become a military aviator and nothing else. <laughs> From then on, school and books meant nothing to me. <laughs> All I wanted was aeroplanes. I began to skip school and walk some 25 kilometers to the aerodrome to watch the aeroplanes fly. I began to lie to my father. On Sunday, we would sit down to have dinner with the family, and my father would ask each one of us, five boys and a girl in the family, what did you learn in school last week? And I would say, oh, I had geography, geometry, Greek history, and this and that, all big lies. But when he discovered that I was lying, well, I pay a penalty. He cut my expenses, and uh, he restricted me from going here or there, and that was it. But all along as I was growing up, you know, I was really dreaming that eventually when I finish high school to get to the Greek Air Force Academy that produced the aviators. Well, that was a wishful thinking because I did not have the ability to take any exams. I knew nothing about those exams and uh, I decided to forget about the Greek Air Force Academy and start thinking about leaving Greece and go someplace else to learn to fly. That someplace else, it happened to be America. I had learned so much about this wonderful country from the movies, Westerns and uh, the gangsters from Chicago, Al Capone and all those. <laughs> anyway, uh, this wonderful country was just fascinating to me as I was growing up. And I waited until I passed my 18th birthday to really just try to do something to get to this country. And my first attempt, you wouldn't believe this year, one Sunday my father said, son, go down to the coast and get me the Sunday paper. I walked down there. And of course, as I picked up the paper, the thing that I was interested in were the sport, uh, sports uh, page. But nearby that page, there was an ad. Make your next travel to New York with the Italian luxurious liner Rex, arriving in the port of Perea, such and such date. When that ocean liner arrived in the port of Perea, I was down there watching that beautiful ship. It was departing the following day. So the night before that following day, I invaded my mother's cooking jar at picked up a lot of cookies, filled up my packet. I took my books and I put them in a, uh, in a box nearby the, in our yard there. My father had uh, a chicken uh, coop there with some chickens and I covered the books and uh, I left the house. I left a note at my home. I'm sorry, father and mother and brothers and sister for doing this to you, but I'll be in touch. Uh, I took the subway. I didn't have to pay because my father was really working for the subway. He was a driver. I went down to the port of Piraeus, walked down to the pier where the Rex was docked, and I looked at that beautiful ship, and I said, how do I get on board? At one moment, I thought of, if you really recall how they tied those uh, big vessels, you know, on the harbor with the heavy ropes. For a moment, I thought maybe I can try to climb on that there like the old Tarzan, Johnny Weissmiller. But I said, wait a minute. I said, do I have the strength, you know, to go all the way? On the other hand, somebody's liable to see me. No, that's not a good way. But anyway, all of a sudden, you know, a truck 
arrived loaded with trunks and suitcases that belonged to Greek passengers who were going to New York, no doubt. Four guys jumped down and began to unload the truck that had stopped by the accommodation ladder, and they really had a big pile of, uh, of uh, goods there, trunks and suitcases, and uh, the truck left, and the four people remained there, and they began to carry the goods through the accommodation ladder up to the top deck. My God, I said, on the second round, I said, why don't you pick up two suitcases and follow them? That's exactly what I did. I got to the top deck, and the policeman, the harbor, po harbor policeman, they had standing by to check who is coming and who is going. He didn't say anything to me. Immediately, I said, I got to find a place to drop this here and then look for a place to hide. As I turned into a passage there to the right, a door opened, slapping my face. The foreman of the four guys had really unloaded some suitcases in that uh, room there. And he looked at, he immediately, you know, I dropped my suitcases because the door slapped me in the face. And he looked at me, he said, who in the heck are you? What are you doing with these suitcases? Uh, I, I, you know, I began to tremble and scare like the devil. And I said, I said, my, my, my father, you know, from the coast down to the entrance of the harbor, he asked me to come up and help you guys. Maybe I can make some tips, a big lie. And uh, I said, no, we don't need you. And he wrapped my hand and took me by the policeman and I was thrown off the wrecks. That's how I miss using the wrecks to stow away to America. I stood right there and I said, next time when you are here, I'm gonna find a different way to get on board, period. So I didn't give up. About a month later, we, we were playing soccer after school and one of my buddies, you know, said, uh, you, you see that fellow there in red? He had a red top. I said, yeah, he's an American. A, an American? What is he? He wants to play soccer with us. My God, he was a Greek-American fellow by the name Harry Apostle from Buffalo, New York. Boy, I got so excited when I met that guy and we became friends. He played uh, soccer with us. We went to the movies. He, he was visiting his uncle, by the way. A friend, a, an attorney, a friend of my father that used to play cards at the coffee house. Anyway, we went to the movies with Harry and he told me so many things and I told Harry what I had attempted to do. He said, you would have never made it because at night in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, a so cold, wherever you have found a place to hide, you would have died. But he said, there is another way that you can get to America get a job on a merchant ship, and someday that merchant ship will dock on an American port. And when that happens, you just get away from the port and find your way to New York. The Greek fellows there, restaurants and the Greek churches, somebody's gonna help you. You say, it might take a year, it might take six months, it might take a week or a few days. After I pass my 18th birthday, Without, I got a, a copy of my birth certificate and I joined the Greek Merchant Marine and uh, without telling anything to my father or to my family. So I then, uh, about a month later, through some connections, I had a job on a 10,000 ton freighter as an assistant fireman. What on earth, you know, does the assistant fireman do on board the ship? I had no idea. Finally, I revealed to my father, and of course my father, who was born in Sparta and served in the Greek Navy, he knew about the sea, and he said, oh, that's a good idea, so you're gonna become a man if you're going to really work at sea. Anyway, uh, he gave me his blessing to go, and he gave me eight American dollars. Where he had found that money, I have no idea. He said, this is American money. You can use them anywhere in the world. Anyway, I reported for duty at the vessel on the 25th of March, 1938, Greek Independence Day. I met the two firemen that I was supposed to be the assistant, and I asked one of them, what does this uh, assistant fireman uh, do on board the ship? Well, he said, let me take you downstairs. He took me down below, and you see, my God, a mountain of black coal from here to way down there. And he said, you see this wheelbarrow? And you see this shovel? You shovel coal 
into the wheelbarrow, you push it down there, and you dump it into the pit for the two firemen, myself and my other firemen, you know, we can feed the furnaces. I looked at the wheelbarrow, a small Volkswagen. <laughs> I looked at the shovel, I was dreaming of a shovel, I can, it was a monstrosity. Anyway, that was my job down there. The first shift, I want you to know, I was completely dead. I went to my bunk there to sleep, you know, and I wanted to sleep for a week. But slowly, you know, evidently, I became familiar and uh, my body, you know, accepted the, the, the miserable work and uh, it worked out okay. Uh, we, we, were, we left Greece on the 25th of March, 1938, for Oran, Algeria, to pick up a load of iron ore for a place by the name Baltimore. I really had no idea where Baltimore was. You know, as I said, I knew New York and Chicago and Hollywood with cowboys and all that. And then I asked this uh, one of the firemen, I said, where is this Baltimore we're going to? Oh, he said, that's a big city, you know, about two hours by train from New York. If there was a happy crew member on board that ship, I was the one. <laughs> but I never revealed to anybody that I had a dream. We left Oran, crossed the Straits of Gibraltar, we got into the Atlantic and we ran into a storm. It was so bad that for 24 hours we never really went anywhere. The, I got seasick and I began to cry and not forgiving myself what I had really put my, my body through. Anyway, we went through that storm and uh, slowly we arrived in Baltimore on a Friday evening. We couldn't really dock inside the harbor because another vessel had occupied the berth. So we anchored outside and I began to immediately, you know, think how on earth do I get ashore now? I thought for a moment if I could really secure a plastic bag to put my clothes in and swim ashore, maybe about a hundred yards, something like that ashore. And, uh, but that I, gave, I gave up on that because I, I was never a good swimmer. And I said, if I get in trouble, but, uh, that's it. So all of a sudden, I heard a small, I got up early morning, Sunday morning, by the way, and nobody was up except the cook and myself. And I got dressed up, I took my $8 with me. And then I was walking up and down at the, in the middle of the ship, ship there by the galley. And all of a sudden, I heard a small putt putt boot. I, I looked over and I saw a, an elderly fellow. He ducked his little boat at the accommodation ladder. He climbed up, and I noticed he had a bunch of newspapers, you know, under his shoulder. And I felt newspapers, probably delivering newspapers to the vessels that were parked outside the harbor. Anyway, he went by me, he went over to the cook. Uh, at the galley and drop a paper. Then he dropped another paper at the officer's dining room, and then he began to go down. And I said, my God. Then I leaned over, and I thought, my God, maybe he can take me over. I took a dollar out of my pocket, and I whistled at him kind of slowly, and I waved the dollar, me, and he gave him the signal, come down. <laughs> so I came down, and that's how I really landed on American soil about the middle of April, 1938. But where do I go from there? It took me all day to find the railway tracks that would lead me to the station. I finally got to the station, but again, I didn't know where to go or what to do. But I remember one time, one of the firemen, well, while we were crossing the Atlantic, he told us a story how a few years back, he had come to Baltimore with another ship and another crew member who wanted to go to New York and uh, to see his uncle. And uh, he said, well, we uh, got to the station and uh, bought our tickets and uh, got on the train, beautiful train, you know. He said, a couple hours by, by the train. And I said, wait a minute, now how did you buy your tickets, you know, if you don't speak English? You know, if you had money, fine. Oh, he says, well, you have to have money. You go to the counter and you tell the man, ticket for New York. Do you know how many times I repeated those words while I was silently called? Maybe a thousand times to really memorize them. So here I am at the station, and I don't know where to go or what to do, and I saw a man in uniform, and my father, who was really a driver for the subway in Athens, he wore uniform, and I felt that 
this guy must be with the railway. I went over to him and I had my dollar and I said, uh, ticket for New York, and he pointed out the window. That's where I purchased my ticket. I got on the train, arrived in New York. I came out on 34th Street and 8th Avenue at the Pennsylvania station, crying like a baby who had lost his mother at the shopping center. I didn't know where to go, what to do. And I remember I began to walk on the eastern side of 8th Avenue towards 42nd Street. I think I got as far as 42nd Street because I remember later on when I began to movies, to go to the movie houses in, on 42nd Street, all lighted, it was so beautiful that night. And then I decided to go back to the railway station to reorient myself, still, you know, crying. I wanted to ask someone, you know, for help or something, but I didn't know what to say. Then all of a sudden, as I was walking back to the station in darkness, I noticed across the avenue the Greek and the American flag. Oh, my God, I said, the Greek flag. There must be some Greeks there. And slowly, I tried to cross the avenue. I almost got hit by a car, not knowing anything about traffic, because I remember the guy, the guy put, slammed his brakes on it, and there was big squeaking. Anyway, I got across there. It was a movie house that was playing the first movie ever made in Greece. The Shepherd's Daughter, which I had seen and all the Greeks had seen. Oh, my God. I was admiring the black and white pictures, if you remember those days, the old days. And then, all of a sudden, two people stopped behind me and began to talk in Greek. One, one was saying, what do the Greeks know about making movies? Movies are made in Hollywood. You know, the other guy said, let's go in. If we don't like it, we can always walk out. I, turned, I got so excited, I turned right back and I said, excuse me, but what is it you want to know about this movie? I, I saw this movie in Athens. And the elder fellow, who turned out to be brothers, by the way, the other fellow said, you saw this movie in Athens? And what are you doing here? I said, the, the way you're dressed up looked like you came out from a ship you know, or something. I said, I did. I said, I left the ship in Baltimore and I don't want to go back. I want to stay in this school. Oh, where are you going to stay? He said, do you have anybody? No, I said, I don't know. Maybe I can find a Greek church, you know. And No, he says, the Greek church can help you. He says, this is my brother. He said, we live in Brooklyn. You come with us. And that's how I was saved from my miserable journey to America. They were so wonderful. And uh, this guy, about three, four days later, he took me to an employment agency on 6th Avenue, that was managed by a Greek fellow. And this employment agency was for individuals, for dishwashers, for restaurants, or hotel, or bakeries, something like that. And my God, he got me a job at a bakery on 147th Street and Broadway as an assistant uh, doing things. That was my first job in America. I lived in Brooklyn for about two, three weeks because at the bakery, the place had also a restaurant and a uh, soda fountain and a bar. Uh, I met a Greek waiter there, and he said, you live in Brooklyn with your eye? I didn't tell him who, how I had come to America. I told him that I was another lie. I was living with my uncle. He said, you live in Brooklyn? He said, I live just two blocks away from here, and in my apartment I have an extra room for $3 a week. He said, uh, why did you? My God, that's what I did. Anyway, that was my first job in America. My first objective was to learn English. I had, I had taken French in high school in Athens, but you didn't speak French here, you spoke English, so I had to learn English. I wanted to go to a night school, but my working hours were from eight in the morning until eight at night. So I got hold of a Greek English dictionary, and I began to learn English through that method. Later on, I discovered a night school, and I attended that for a few weeks. And uh, about seven, eight months later, I had learned enough English, and I began to take flying lessons at Floyd Bennett Field, the Greek fellow in the bakery, not in the bakery, in the soda fountain, uh, Jimmy, he, I told him that I love airplanes. Oh, he says, you know, I, I know the Brooklyn Airport, you know, in... I mean, uh, Floyd Bennett Field Airport in the Brooklyn. Uh, you know, we can go there. So, my God, he took me down there one time. 
and we located the flying school. Joe Agliata was the owner of the flying school. It was really an aero club. You had to pay $20 to join the aero club, then you pay $12 to fly with an instructor, and $8 for solo. Anyway, I started to fly. I was the happiest guy on earth. And I wanted to scream so bad one day, I said, after I had solo, by the way, I said, I'm going to scream so strong, and I hope the waves, you know, will take the vo the, my voice, you know, and take them to Greece for my friends, you know, to see that I had been able to do what I wanted to do. Anyway, I solo at Floyd Bennett Field, but then a Greek fellow I had met in uh, Manhattan, he said, you pay $12 for a an hour of flying with the instructor? I said, yeah. He said, there is an airport in New Jersey, Westfield Airport. They have a school there, and you pay $8 with the instructor and $6 for solo. A week later, I went to that agency, employment agency, and I got a job at the Park Hotel in Plainfield, New Jersey. And that's where I continue my, my flying. I got my private pilot's license. But then one day, as I, my job at the hotel, by the way, was a pantry, pantry boy. I was in a pantry preparing the coffee, the salads, and dishing out the desserts and what have you for the waiters and waitresses. Then one day, I thought the world was really going to fall down for me. A gentleman walked into the kitchen and uh, talk, was talking to the chef, and the chef pointed at me. And that gentleman came over. He said, are you Spiro Pisanos? I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm from the immigration, and you must come with me. Come with you? Where? He said, Ellis Island. He said, you came to Baltimore, he said, and that was wrong. You know, anyone who comes to this country comes through Ellis Island from Europe. So anyway, I said, can I go to my room to put my street clothes on? Yes, he said, but I must come with you. But I want to warn you. Don't you pull anything because I am armed. So the man came into my room. I changed, and we caught the train a few blocks away from the hotel. He didn't say anything until we arrived at Jersey City, and we caught the ferry boat to Ellis Island. He says, you know, I don't know what the director is going to do with you. The Germans have invaded your country, and uh, I don't think they can send you back. So we'll see. I spent one night at Ellis Island, and the following day, and one of the officers there in uniform, he was going, there were many, many people there, and he was going around and ho hollering, Pisanos, Pisanos, and I raised my hand, I said, follow me, he said. He took me to the director's office, and who was inside that office? The owner of the Park Hotel, a German fellow, who had come to this country the same way I did. <laughs> and now he owned that Park Hotel. He was a waiter on the SS Bremen, and after his third journey, if I'm not mistaken, uh, he decided to heck with the sea, I want to stay in this country. Anyway, he met his wife, she had some money, and that's how they bought the hotel. Anyway, he was, he was in, the, in the office of the director of Ellis Island. Evidently, when he found out from the chef what had happened, he came over, he drove all the way to Jersey City, took the ferry to Ellis Island, and the guy tried to rescue me. I didn't know that. Anyway, I, here I am, face the director of Ellis Island, you know, and he said to me, young man, we cannot send you back in your place of birth. The Germans have occupied Greece. And here is this paper, he said, you carry that with you. you can, you're authorized to work anywhere you want to. But this gentleman wants you back at this uh, hotel he owns or something. And that was it. I felt like, you know, going around the, his desk and grab that man and kiss that son of a bug five times. But, you know, I, 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 hes I hesitated a little bit. Anyway, I thanked the man so much. And as I was walking out, my Mr. Stender, of course, thanked the guy too. And as we were w walking out the door, you know, he says, uh, a young man, he said, I had really made a statement there why I had come to this country, that I had learned to fly, and that I had acquired a private pilot's license. And he said, young man, good luck with your flying. Anyway, so the war in Europe began in 1939. After the Battle of Britain, at the end of 1940, the RAF had lost so many pilots. 
and they came to this country to recruit civilian qualified pilots without any publicity. The only guy who was objecting to that problem was J. Hector Hoover. You know, he, he made statements that uh, we cannot allow the American boys to volunteer for the Royal Air Force, period. But evidently, either Winston Churchill or somebody from England got in touch with FDR. And they say that FDR told J. Hector Hoover to look the other way and allow the American boys to join the RAF. And that's how we got away. But I also had a problem. When my instructor told me where to go, uh, it, well, they had an office at the Waldorf Astoria on the 13th floor. On my day off, I took my logbook and my license, and I went and visited that uh, office, and I met squander leader George Graves. Truthfully, I only had 170 hours flying time, but the requirement was 200 hours. When this gentleman looked at my logbook, he says, but uh, you don't have 200 hours. And I, I, w I was just about, you know, to really kill myself, you know, for not being qualified to join. And I said to the man, maybe I can go back and uh, fly some more and be back in two, three weeks. No, 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 no. He says, you know, he called the secretary, his secretary, and he said, help Mr. Pisanos to complete the application. We completed the application, and I, you know, he told me that they'll let me know later on. About a month later, I got a call from New York uh, in the dining room we had within the kitchen for the dining room, small dining room for the help. There was a public telephone, and that's the telephone number I had given squad leader George Graves. He called me up and he said, Mr. Pisanos, I wish to inform you that you have been accepted to join the Royal Air Force. I was the happiest guy in that kitchen. <laughs> and, and then for a moment, for a moment, then I said, now, wait a minute now, I got a big problem. How do I tell a German who was my, my boss, a German from Hamburg, Germany, that I was, I'm going to leave the hotel and that I was going to Europe to fight Germany? So I, I had to do it. I had to, for about a day or so, honest to God, I was going up and down. I didn't know how to approach this problem. So one day I decided to really go to his office. I knocked the door and I said, Mr. Stender? He said, oh, Steve. He said, come in. And by the name, Steve, my Greek name was Spiro. But the chef in the kitchen, when I first met him, you know, he looked at me and he said, God damn it. He said, long, long time ago, I worked for a Greek fellow. You should look like him. His name was Steve. And from then on, he began to call me Steve. That's how that name stuck with me. But later on, when I was at the Pentagon, I changed that officially, and it's really on my official papers. Anyway, so now here I am now. How do I tell Mr. Stender? You know, so I said, here I am in his office. He said, uh, uh, Mr. Stender, I said, I probably have to leave the... He says, why? He says, I gave you two pay raises. Do you want another pay raise? Truthfully, I was working like a slave in there. When I went on my day off, the chef had to put the dishwasher and the busboy to do my job. I had worked up a system, you know, tic-tac-toe. I knew exactly what to do. I had, I had prepared at least, you know, the first thing in the morning, coffee. Uh, open clams and ostrich, you know, for lunch and this and that. And uh, anyway, so then... Uh, he said, uh, D don't I pay you? No, no, no Mr. Stender. I said, I have joined the Royal Air Force and I'm going to England and I'm going to fight Germany. I said, I, I thought the sky was going to fall. He got up. That man got up. He came around and he hugged me like he was my father. And he said, Steve, I want you to go there and give heck to that dog and Hitler and his pals. They have ruined Germany. He says, I never supported him. I never liked him. And he said, my God, honestly, I, I felt, I, you have no idea how I felt in my heart. And I want you to know, while I was overseas, every month I would get packages from the Park Hotel with cookies and goodies and everything. And they told me when I left, after they had a big celebration, with the chief of police was there, the mayor was there, and God knows other politicians, you know, when they gave me it uh, sent away. Anyway, uh, I left there, and uh, when I joined the Royal Air Force, they sent me to California at, at uh, Grand Central Air Terminal to attend Polaris Flight Academy. 
to learn how to fly really the military way. I spent about uh, three and a half months there and I got about 90 hours on military aircraft and uh, it felt wonderful. Then upon graduation, of course, I thank God I was graduated as a pilot officer equivalent to a second lieutenant, whereas some of my classmates, 15 of us in a class, some of my seven classmates were appointed as sergeant pilots, the other eight as pilot officers. Anyway, we left the country through Canada, arrived in England, and in England I uh, had to go through an officer's training school and an operational training unit. What you learn in the operational training unit is how to dogfight how to strafe locomotives or targets on the ground. And uh, I finished the uh, officer's training school, and then after that I went to the operational training unit. It was really wonderful. I began to fly the Hurricane, and then later on the Spitfire. And the aim of the instructors we had there, one of my instructors, by the way, was a Battle of Britain ace with 13 victories, and he was really showing me the tricks of dogfighting, uh, strafing a locomotive. And the British, you know, really believe that when you strafe a target on the ground, you don't pull up like that to get away. And uh, whereas uh, the replacements we got from America later on, when we were doing strafing, that's what they were doing, and they were dead. So the RAF believed that after you strafe a locomotive, you just drop down and you fly below treetop level at 400 miles an hour to get away. <laughs> the gunners, you know, can't see you. And that's how I, I think uh, during my tour with the RAF and uh, the fourth fighter group, I must have sat uh, strafe six locomotives. And every time I did that, I dropped down below treetop levels. But you had to be careful, high tension wires and everything else. Anyway, uh, then, after I graduated from the operational training unit, I was assigned to a squadron, 268 fighter squadron that were flying P-51 Mustang A's with the Allison engine, low level, not high altitude. But I had a problem while I was, after I had flown about seven missions over Holland, strafing locomotives and other targets. One day I received a call from a wing commander, Kinatos, a Greek representative who had an office in London that represented the exiled Greek Air Force. When Germany invaded Greece, many of the pilots escaped from Greece. Some of them went to Cyprus, some to North Africa, some to Malta, and some to England. But the, the exiled government in London, they had difficulties to locate those guys. They wanted to really locate the escaped Greek pilots to send them to Egypt because they were trying to form a Spitfire squadron, Greek Air Force Spitfire squadron with Greek pilots. And uh, the only way was to go to the Air Ministry and pick up a roster of active RAF pilots and look for the Greek names. That's how they got me. Anyway, I went to London and I faced a gentleman in uniform. I was in uniform. I saluted when I walked into his office. He said, Mr. Pisanos, he said, I'm going to take you away from the RAF and send you to Egypt to join this squadron that retired for him. I said, sir, I don't want to go to Egypt. I want to stay with the RAF here. If I survive, I want to go back to America and become an American. I said, that's why. Well, he said, you are a Greek subject. I know I need you. I said, I know you need me, but I don't want to go to Egypt. And <laughs> Honestly, honestly, I walked away from his office without even saluting. I didn't want to have anything to do, and so I was really fearful that they liable to pull at uh, Sananigan and go to the Air Ministry and say, this guy is a Greek subject and we want you to release him. So I had met Chesley Peterson, who was the commander of 71 Eagle Squadron. I had met him at the American Club one day, and I thought for a moment, why don't I go to see if you know, Peterson can help me. I went to the American Eagle Club in London on Charing Cross Road, and the lady up there, an American lady, by the way, who had volunteered to do work in England, I said, Mr. Dexter, I said, how can I find Chesley Peterson? My lad, she said, Chesley is here in, in London, and he has left a telephone number. Oh, you want to talk to him? I said, yes, it's very important. 
My God, she called Peterson. I talked to Peterson. I said, Sarah, I got to see you. It's very, very important. Okay, he said, lunch at the Regent Palace Hotel, a hotel we used to patronize. So I met Peterson. I told him the, what the Greek uh, Air Force was trying to do to me. Well, first of all, he said, do you want to go to Egypt? I said, no, sir. I don't want to go to Egypt. Okay, that's it. I'm going to fighter command, and I'm going to really take care of it. So he went to fighter command. He was telling me later on. But the fighter command was kind of hesitant to really, uh, you know, try to intervene. They felt if the Greeks want this guy, let him have it. But Peterson says, now, wait a minute. You spend more than $50,000 to train this guy as a fighter pilot. Now you are to release this guy to go to Egypt at a squadron does not exist. Does that make sense? And finally, this guy at fighter command, he said, Pete, he said, I think you're right. Let's get Pisanos out of this 268 squadron to 71 Eagle squadron. And if the Greeks want him, they have to go to Peterson. That's exactly what happened. They told me immediately, pick up your things and go to Depton and report to 71 Eagle Squadron. Anyway, they never really uh, called. That's how I got to the 71 Eagle Squadron. But then I was faced with another problem. When America came to war and began to send, after Pearl Harbor, and began to send uh, General Spudge, uh, Doolittle, and Kepner, and all those to England, their aim was to take all the Americans from the three Eagle Squadron, 250 guys, all, all PhD diplomas, you know, in the air fighting. Uh, as you can see, I mean, the Air Force, uh, the Army Air Force at the time, they wanted to have us. So anyway, it was officially that everybody had to go to the U.S. Army Air Corps at the time. And they had to go through an interview in London and a physical. And that was it. So I told Peterson, I said, that doesn't apply. He said, look, General Spatz told me that they want every one of us, and that includes you. So you better go to London, get your physical, get your interview. And anyway, I went to London, and I faced three Army Air Corps colonels in a special office in a building next to the American Embassy. We had to, everyone had to go through that interview. So I went in, I saluted, and these three full colonels, they spotted my accent. He said, uh, what nationality are you? I said, uh, Greek. And of course, Greece was at war with Germany at the time. And uh, they had a little chit chat. And uh, oh my God, I said, that's it. They're not going to attack me. And then the man in the middle, Colonel Henry Stovall, I remember his name. He said, young man. I, well, you know, the, the, I told him that uh, my dream was that if I survived the war, you know, to go back to America and become an American. So the man in the middle, you know, he said, young man, will you accept a commission as a second lieutenant in the Army Air Force? I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I thought it was a dream. I, I, you know, I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's how I got into the Army Air Force without being an American citizen. Anyway, now, May the 3rd, 1943. We, we, by the way, when we transfer over, we kept our Spitfires. We were doing the same thing as we were doing with the RAF. Then later on, we got the P-47s. And our Peterson and then this fellow, Don Blexley, the greatest aerial commander in Europe, was Don Blexley. And I'll say some more about him later. Uh, uh, they wanted to really get a fighter where we can get slowly into Berlin and hit Hitler and his pals in the German capital. Anyway, so then we got the P-47s later on, and uh, on the 3rd of May, I was playing with my roommate, Don Gentile, with the two new P-47s. We were dog fighting over the sea, about, about 30,000 feet, and the tower called me up, Pecton 39, that was my call sign. You are to return to base and pine cake immediately. Pancake in RAF terminology is land. Anyway, immediately, you know what went through my mind? The Greeks have gone to the authorities and probably to the American embassy and say, you guys are wrong to take this man into the Army Air Force. He is a Greek subject and we want him. So anyway, I told my friend Gentile, you know, I said, Don, I got to go. He said, okay, see you later. So I 
dove down and I landed and there was Peterson and my squadron commander in a staff car by the parking spot where I put my P-47. I, the, I asked the crew chief, I said, what, uh, what, well, he said, they've been here for some time, you know, waiting every day for you. So I dropped down from the aircraft and I went over and I saluted. My squadron commander came off the front uh, seat there and Peterson says, get in the car. Oh my God, I said, that's it. The Greeks have really done it. So, and he's going to, uh, so we went to his office and he said, sit down. And he grabbed the phone. Colonel Peterson, he said, connect me with the embassy. Oh, my God, I said, the embassy, probably somebody at the embassy will tell me that uh, you're not welcome in the Air Force. He said, uh, uh, Peterson here, will you connect me with the ambassador's office? John, uh, John no, yeah, John Wynat was the ambassador. He were, with Pete, they were good friends. And uh, the phone, evidently, the Pete says, John, I got the lieutenant right here, and I think you better tell him. You know what threw my mind. Oh my God, I said, here I am. Uh, they're not gonna, they're gonna kick me out, period. So here I am. He gave me the telephone, you know, shaking like the devil, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yes, me, me talking to an ambassador. I said, yeah, 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 yes, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, yeah. Lieutenant, how would you like to become an American citizen here in London today? <laughs> I think my heart really left me and says, I'll wait for you outside. <laughs> but I said, but, but sir, I, I was going to wait to get back. No, no, no. He says, you know, a special emissary has come from Washington to naturalize six of you boys, and you're going to be the first one. So Peterson now lighted his pipe, and he was smiling like no one's business. You know, <laughs> so after... He says, you better get down to London, you know, immediately because the special representative will come to my office any moment here and the ceremony is going to be a big one. So anyway, after he talked to Peterson a little bit and uh, we hung up, I said, well, he said, surprise? I wanted to surprise you, that's all. Anyway, I got on my uniform, got the train, London, uh, directed to the embassy, ambassador's office, and I met the gentleman, Dr. Henry Stovall was the gentleman from the Department of Justice who had specially, specially appointed to naturalize six of us that were serving in the U.S. Air Force at the time who were not Americans. Anyway, uh, we had a little time and he said at two o'clock in the afternoon the ceremony will take place here and then Mr. Uh, the, Mr. Hazard uh, decided to go and have some coffee before two o'clock and we did. At two o'clock I walked into a place you wouldn't believe this year, about five or seven times the number of people we have here had occupied that place. Walter Cronkite was there, Andy Rooney was there, and so Ed Morrow. They were sitting up in the front. Anyway, so the ceremony started, and, uh, and this is what Dr. Uh, Hazard uh, told him. Gentlemen, I want you to witness the naturalization process here for the first time in American history, naturalizing an individual outside the U.S. continental limits. And that's what happened. The celebration was absolutely superb. I, I, I shook hands with many, many people. An English uh, newspaper guy, you know, came to me and he said, Hey, the Lieutenant, how do you feel now that you have become a Yank in British soil? I said, <laughs> Terrific. More pay. I said, you know, that I, what I was making in the RAF as a pilot officer, I was making $85. In the Air Corps, $320. I was a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, here we are now dogfighting and uh, escorting the bombers. Uh, they really, uh, the 8th the Air Force, uh, decided to pick up the 4th Fighter Group and specialize them for escort into Germany. I took part on the first escort into Germany. I took part on the first escort to Berlin on the 3rd of March, 1944. And uh, dogfighting with Luftwaffe, and it's interesting. Uh, years later, I was in Paris at La Bourget at the air show there, and I met Adolf Galland, the chief fighter boss of the Luftwaffe. We had a real reunion with the guy at, uh, 
he couldn't believe, you know, we, I, we met uh, in, inside the Bell helicopter uh, chalet. A Greek Air Force general had invited me to join him in Paris. Anyway, so I sat next to Adolf Galland, and uh, he looked at me. I had civilian clothes, of course. He said, are you helicopter pilot? I said, no, general. I don't like helicopters. I fly good airplanes. What airplanes do you fly? <laughs> what, what airplanes do you fly now? Oh, I said, I don't fly now, but uh, in the war, I flew Spitfire. <gasps> you, you, you flew Spitfires? I think his chair must have gone five inches above the ground. <laughs> I, I, I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I flew. I said, General, I was with the fourth fighter group. And I said, I was on the first escort mission to Berlin on the 3rd of March, 1944. And we came over, I said, and if you remember, the weather was bad over the target and the bombers did not drop their bombs. They aborted the mission outside the outskirts of uh, Berlin. Ah, he says, I was meeting with the marshal. And when we were told that the Americans have arrived over Berlin with their bombers, escorted by fighters, the first time, escorted by fighters, I told the marshal, we are kaput. This is what he told Marshal Goring. Anyway, it turned out to be the truth, you know, because later on, the Mustang, you know, like sitting out here, capitulated the Luftwaffe. Anyway, uh, I did uh, strafing, uh, dogfighting. One of the, uh, uh, the, not, I would say, worst dogfighting, I was flying a P-47, and uh, we got into a mix-up east of Frankfurt, I think, and uh, I jumped on a uh, uh, ME 109, and this guy evidently he was dancing all over the, all over the sky. You know, I was trying to get him on my gun sight and fire one. You know, but kept on moving all over and descending at the same time, until we arrived on the deck. And what this gentleman had in mind, we then I noticed that we were approaching high tension wires. I saw the towers. What this gentleman did, he went onto the wires. And he felt that I would go straight through. When I spotted the towers there, then it dawned on me what he was trying to do to me. So I pulled up my P-47, barely missing the top cable. I dropped down on the other side, flying straight about maybe 100 feet above the ground. I opened up right there, and I blasted the heck out of him. Anyway, that was really uh, one of the, uh, I would say, most miserable experience I have had. And uh, thank God I survived uh, all this fighting until the 5th of March, 1944. We had converted to Mustangs at the time because we were able to go to Berlin on the 3rd of March. The 4th of March, back to Berlin again, but as I took off, one of my drop tanks came off and I was out of the mission. I could never really uh, get to Berlin and back. Evidently, the mechanics uh, didn't really, uh, that's what they said, uh, something, somebody did not uh, type the tank properly. Anyway, so on the 5th of March, escort mission to Bordeaux, B-24s, that they were going to bomb two aerodromes the Germans were using with JU-88s that they would take off from those aerodromes, come out in the Atlantic, and bomb the convoys that brought the goods to England from Canada and the US. Anyway, we got to Bordeaux. Uh, half of our squadron came back. Uh, they couldn't make it to the target. The reason was that when we f got the first shipment of Mustang Bs, they did not really bring any spark plugs with the aircraft. The aircraft arrived with any, uh, any spark plugs on the engine. So then the generals wanted to put the aircraft up in the air. They began to use Spitfire plugs. On the first Berlin mission, four P-51Bs, they had engine quit, engine failure. So anyway, we got over Bordeaux, we got into a dogfight. I shot down two, and I chased two more. When I hit them, the first one dropped into the clouds, and I lost the guy. Then his friend evidently was behind me, but I managed you know, to make some turns, and I got on his tail. I fired at him, and uh, he began to smoke, and he did the same thing. And I was just alone. I decided to come home. I climbed up to about 22,000 feet, and. It was just about south of Limans. Limans was here, Le Havre was here. I was going to go to Limans and then Le Havre and then cross the channel. 
overly much my engine began to act funny. The, sp the RAF uh, uh, Spitfire plugs were good for about seven, eight, maybe nine hours. Then the boys had to change them. Well, on that mission, I think I uh, down to Bordeaux and uh, at, uh, by Le Mans, I had about uh, possibly six, close to six hours or maybe five and a half hours or so. We had external tanks, of course. And uh, my engine began to really uh, squawk and yawn and moan. And oh my God, I said, I, I really said, this is it. This pl the plugs, no doubt. I changed the mixture, I uh, changed the RPM, nothing to it. So then I was approaching Le Havre at just about, I was at 22,000 feet, just about over Le Havre, bang, the engine quit. I, I declare an emergency, Mayday, and uh, the controller from England says, you know, aircraft on, on May Day, you know, give us a long transmission. I repeated May Day, May Day, Pecton 39, this and that, but they couldn't help me. I had a dead engine and I couldn't really make it. Then all of a sudden, bang, I lost my radio. Now, as I was just coming over the car, the, the guys opened up their ACAC and honest to God, I said, they bound to suit the heck out of me with a dead engine. So I decided to turn right back and bail out somewhere further down. That's what I did. I decided to, and then those days, you know, they used to tell us intelligence, do not, repeat, do not bail out in high altitude. Because the Germans had a habit, you know, of shooting guys coming down in a parachute. And uh, the warning was, wait until about three, 4,000 feet and jump. Anyway, I waited about 2,000 feet and I released my canopy and buckle everything. And as I tried to step out from the, to the wing, I had forgotten to connect the cord from the May West to, from the dinky to my May West. In case, you know, you go in the channel, the mo you bail out over the channel, the moment your feet hit the ground, hit the water, you know, you just, you turn a buckle here. We had REF parachutes, not the American, where you had to connect here and here. We, you turn the buckle here, pop that, there goes the parachute, but the cord will pull the dinghy out of the parachute, and you had a little boat there to survive. I had forgotten to connect that, and that thing was when dogfighting over Bordeaux, evidently must have gotten stuck somewhere underneath the seat. Anyway, I had difficulties, and finally, after I'd, uh, I loosened the thing up, and I was outside the wing, I realized that I was too low, too low to leave the aircraft. So I stood right there and I crash landed barely. And thank God, as I was coming over a barn, I reached inside and I pulled the stick slowly. And my God, I killed some of the flying speed I had. And as I went over the other side of the barn, the right wing hit the ground first. The aircraft went a little bit to the right and I was throwing, barely missing the stop propeller. How I survive, I have no I idea. I thought of putting fire on the aircraft and get away from there. I took my scarf off, an old piece of parachute the boys had given me. I dipped it in one of the fuel tanks. I began to take the matches out of my escape kit because I never smoked and I never carry matches with me. And as I was really doing that process, I heard uh, firing. I looked down there and my God, two German soldiers were coming after me. Oh my God, I said, they tried to scare me. I tried to, 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 to light again and the bullets became, began to come over my head. And they hit the, actually they hit the vertical stabilizer of my 51. Oh my God, I said, they're after me. I dropped everything and I began to walk into a forest nearby. And it was there where they came in a forest. They began to talk in German. What they were saying, I had no idea. Probably you better give up, we're gonna kill you. Anyway, I had attended a, an escape uh, lecture one time from an RAF pilot who escaped from a prison camp in Germany. He escaped. He walked all the way through Germany, through Holland, Belgium, France, down to Spain. And he came back to England. And he was the guy giving the lectures, you know. And he, I remember he always said, get into a forest. That's where you can get away from the enemy. Anyway, I got into the forest and uh, everything was quiet and I don't know whether I made a circle, a triangle or a rectangle. I came out the same way I had gone in and I could see my aircraft. I got away from there. I jumped a fence. I walked on a paved road around the bend. The motorcycle, these two gentlemen had arrived. I thought 
later on, you know, when I saw that uh, great escape with old Steve McQueen, how he stole the motorcycle, but I didn't know how to drive it. But even if I did, where, where would I go? You know, they would have really captured me. Anyway, so I jumped on another fence there, and for five days, I, by the way, I had a miserable left shoulder. It was so painful. Later on, the French uh, doctor, of the underground doctor, it was dislocated, and he and another man helped, and they fixed my shoulder. Anyway, for five days, I wandered all over the French countryside, drinking water from running creeks, from... Uh, eating dandelions and whatever I can find on the ground. And uh, the fifth day, I made contact with a, with a young fellow, and he looked at me and he said, Vous avez anglais? I said, no, American, American. He took me to his house, and then in the evening, he took me to a coffee shop where I met uh, the real underground guys. Uh, the people decided that, uh, now remember, I went down the 5th of March, three months before the invasion. The decision was that, period, all the pilots from London, all the pilots, down pilots, British and Americans, have to be gathered at central locations. You know, we were scattered all over France, and, uh, you know, with the invasion, the people, you know, would have had difficulties, you know, try to locate this guy here, this guy here. So the instructions was locate them at central locations. I, I remember when I was in Paris later on, they moved me to Paris, by the way, and I spent uh, six months in Paris, oh, and I lived in 16 different families, underground families. And uh, my God, I remember, you know, that uh, the last house that they moved me in, just about the, I would say, the latter part of uh, May, before June 6th invasion. We were 32 Americans inside in a big farmhouse. And this, it was there where I learned that we had to be gathered together. Anyway, uh, the invasion took place. The liberation of Paris took place. I was there during the liberation. And my God, you should have seen the Germans. They were so humiliated, you know, leaving Paris. They, and they, they were stealing everything. They even stole automobiles that the French people had hidden in barns that had taken the rubber out of the, the wheel. They stole, I saw with my eyes, a convertible automobile loaded with wounded soldiers in the back, with the driver up in the front, without rubber wheels, only the goddamn rims. And it was making so much noise, you know, on the gobblestone there, and it was awful. Anyway, uh, Paris was liberated, of course, and then uh, many of us, about 800, came out from hiding. We got back to England, and that was the end of me. No more combat, because I knew too much with the resistance. So I was sent to Wright Field. And uh, I, at Wright Field, I met quite a few guys. Uh, Chuck Yeager joined up uh, later on, Bob Hoover, uh, Gabreski, Dick Bong. Gentelli was, of course, there. And that's why I think they sent me, because Gentelli, Dan Gentelli, and I were roommates in the RAF and then in the Army Air Force after we transferred. Anyway, I, sp I went through test pilot school at Wright Field, and I spent uh, more than a year there. I, uh, I flew all the German fighters we had there. I flew the ME-109, the FW-190, the ME-262, and the Zero. And we did testing. I was selected with Gentelli and two other pilots to do the testing on the YP-80 at Murak Lake. We got some over 100 hours of uh, test time. And then it was uh, at right field. I had an incident with a P-63 blew up at me over Cincinnati at 35,000 feet, and I was able to put the aircraft back. And I always had in mind that the instructors at the test pilot school, you know, always emphasize, if you can, bring the aircraft back so we can find out what happened. If you bail out and the aircraft crashes, we have lost everything. Anyway, I brought the aircraft back. At, uh, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what happened, the Allison engine had incorporated water injection and I was to do the testing with that. That's where I ran into problems. Anyway, uh, after that incident, I left uh, the Air Force and I went to fly for TWA. And uh, I went to Kansas City. And it was there where I met my wonderful wife. I got to married to in 1946 and I lost her last year after 66 years. Anyway, uh, 
I didn't like the airline game. I spent two, two and a half years with TWA, but then I came back on active duty. And Gentile was at the Pentagon, by the way. And at that time, to get back on active duty, you had to have two-year college. I didn't have any college. My God, they took me because I had jet time. At that time, you can really count the jet pilots in your hands. Uh, I spent, uh, I spent, I completed 30 years in the Air Force. And uh, I would volunteer from Germany. I had overseas tours in Na Naples with NATO, Germany, with the headquarters with SAFI. And then I volunteered from Germany to go to Vietnam. I spent a tour in Vietnam. And uh, I, uh, although I volunteered to go as a fighter, but uh, they, I ended up as an uh, uh, airlift uh, squadron uh, pilot. Later on, I took command of the squadron, and uh, I flew 375 missions supporting the Army Special Forces in the jungle of Vietnam. That was my job. Anyway, uh, but that, uh, they gave me command of the squadron later on, and, uh, and uh, they promoted me to colonel. I, after I left Vietnam, I was uh, lieutenant colonel in Kansas City, and uh, my God, they... Uh, I got a telegram from uh, Washington, says, you know, your assignment to Vandenberg has been canceled. You have been promoted to colonel, and you are now assigned as deputy commander at the 308 Ballistic Missiles Wing at Little Rock. From there, I had the assignment to Athens, Greece, <laughs> as, chief, as chief of another telephone call. This guy from the Pentagon said, Pisanos, how would you like to go to Athens as chief of the Air Force mission? My God, I did. And it was just unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. Anyway, let me close here and uh, tell you something that uh, after uh, the Athens assignment. Uh, I am really proud of the success I found in America. And uh, it was really great to also become a U.S. citizen. What America did for me, I have always treasured in my heart as there is so much to be grateful for, the opportunity to really fulfill my boyhood dream and arrive at the rank that I did in the U.S. Air Force. Uh, it, it's just unbelievable, you know, the successes that one can really achieve in this wonderful country. And uh, America, my friends, is the greatest democracy on this planet. It is a country that believes and practices freedom, opportunity, equality, and promise. A country worth loving, serving, fighting for, and dying for Uncle Sam and the American flag. Thank you.